It's Wednesday, October 23rd, and this is the Daily Medical News, where we bring you clinical medicine's top headlines, plus an in-depth look at the day's biggest story. I'm Nick Andrews. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Today, why a doctor's best friend in the clinic may be a dog. Pateromir helps chronic kidney disease patients remain on hypertension meds. Revised guidelines debut for managing acute upper GI bleeding. And women with polycystic ovary syndrome face greater risks of preeclampsia and postpartum depression. Plus, some diabetes drugs might blunt type 2 diabetes increased dementia risk. Wellness among doctors begins with a focus on reducing stress. Attendees at the CHEST annual meeting had the chance to spend time with the ultimate stress reliever, puppies. A local animal rescue organization set up a venue for visiting with a litter of adoptable puppies. Several attendees decided on the spot to adopt one of the pups. Others just took the opportunity to cuddle. Dr. Christopher Carroll is a specialist in pediatric critical care with Connecticut Children's Medical Center in Hartford. Dr. Carroll knows firsthand the ability of animals to relieve stress in both patients and doctors. In an interview at CHESS 2019, Dr. Carroll explained how pet therapy plays a role in his own center. I'm a huge believer in pet therapy in our hospitals. I'm an ICU physician, and I think that pet therapy, even in the ICU, is important. That was something I fought our infection control at our hospital about about a decade ago to to keep pet therapy in the ICUs. I'm a pediatric doctor, so I'm particularly uh, in favor of pets, but I frequently find when the dogs visit us at our children's hospital, the staff gets as much out of it as the patients. So, Do you find that your colleagues are worried about infection issues and... So I actually, did a liter- I actually did a review on that and could not find that dogs, pet therapy, spread infections in any way. So, um, so no, I do not think that, I think if you take proper precautions and you don't let them into isolation rooms, there's no more reason why you can't have a, a pet there than, than a person. Among patients with chronic kidney disease with resistant hypertension, Adding pateromer enables more patients to stay on spironolactone. That's the message Dr. Brian Williams of University College London delivered at the scientific meeting of the Heart Failure Society of America. Given the risk of spironolactone-induced hyperkalemia, guidelines typically steer clear of recommending the drug for resistant hypertension in patients with advanced CKD. Dr. Williams explained that having the potassium binding pateromer on board allowed for more persistent use of spironolactone, and using pateromer also helped CKD patients with or without heart failure. Dr. Williams presented findings from the Phase II AMBER trial. That trial randomized nearly 300 patients with CKD to spironolactone with either pateromer or placebo. After 12 weeks, 86% of the pateromer patients remained on spironolactone, compared with 66% of the placebo patients. And blood pressure lowering was significantly greater in the pateromer group than in the placebo group. Revised guidelines on managing acute upper gastrointestinal bleeding offer recommendations for treating patients on antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy, and they cover endoscopy use and outline new therapeutic approaches. Among the updates, fluid resuscitation should be started in patients with acute upper gastrointestinal bleeding and hypodynamic instability. That can help avoid hemorrhagic shock and restore end organ perfusion while the bleeding is brought under control. The panel also found that patients with a glasgow Bashford score of 1 or less were at very low risk for bleeding and mortality. Thus, those patients may not need hospitalization or inpatient endoscopy. The authors also recommend that all patients with acute upper gastrointestinal bleeding, whether low or high risk, undergo endoscopy within 24 hours of presentation. The guidelines appear in the Annals of Internal Medicine. 
For a comprehensive look, click the link in the podcast notes. We'll be right back with the daily medical news after this. Women with polycystic ovary syndrome are at higher risk for metabolic and psychiatric comorbidities prior to pregnancy. They also face greater cardiometabolic complications during pregnancy and more cardiometabolic and psychiatric complications in the postpartum period. That's according to results from a prize paper at the annual meeting of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Researchers at the Penn Polycystic Ovary Syndrome Center at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia presented findings from a database analysis of more than 42,000 women with PCOS. Prior to pregnancy, women with PCOS in the data set tended to have higher rates of obesity, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, and depression than did patients without PCOS. During pregnancy, there was a higher rate of gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, preterm birth, multiple gestation, and cesarean section in patients with PCOS. In the postpartum period, women with PCOS were more likely to experience postpartum thrombotic disease, postpartum depression, hypertensive heart disease, heart failure, preeclampsia, and peripartum cardiomyopathy. Selected anti-diabetes medications appear to blunt the increased risk of dementia associated with type 2 diabetes. It's a benefit that appears to apply to metformin as well as the newer anti-diabetic agents, specifically the DPP-4 inhibitors, the GLP-1 analogs, and the SGLT-2 inhibitors. In contrast, neither insulin nor sulfonylureas showed any protective effect against dementia development. In fact, Using sulfonylureas was associated with a small but statistically significant 7% increased dementia risk. University of Copenhagen researchers unveiled the findings at the annual Congress of the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology. Dr. Marte Osler is with the University of Copenhagen. Working from a Danish national database, Dr. Osler and her colleagues matched more than 11,000 patients with type 2 diabetes who received a dementia diagnosis with more than 46,000 type 2 diabetes patients without dementia. Patients who had ever used metformin had a significant 6% reduction in the likelihood of dementia. Those on a DPP-4 inhibitor had a 20% reduction in risk. The GLP-1 analogs were associated with a 42% decrease in risk. So were the SGLT-2 inhibitors. And a dose-response relationship was evident. The higher the cumulative exposure to those agents, the lower the odds of dementia. As for combination therapy... The clear risk reduction winners were the combos including SGLT2 inhibitor with a 62% relative risk reduction. Combinations including a DPP4 inhibitor or GLP1 analog were also associated with significant reduced dementia risk. The findings were confirmed, Dr. Osler says, it would warrant exploration of the drugs more generally as potential interventions to prevent dementia. And that's it for today's daily medical news. Be sure to catch the newest episode of the MD Edge Sitecast. New episodes of the Sitecast drop on Wednesdays. For MD Edge, I'm Nick Andrews. And I'm Mary Ellen Schneider. Thanks for listening.